dabei zu sein. Großbritannien und Deutschland sind enge Partner und Verbündete auch für die Aufgaben, die jetzt vor uns stehen. Mit Entsetzen und Entrüstung blicken wir beide in diesen Tagen und Wochen nach Osten auf Russlands völkerrechtswidrigen Angriff auf die Ukraine. Der Krieg ist verheerend. Tod, unfassbares Leid und furchtbare Zerstörung über die Ukraine. Die Bilder, die wir aus Butscha gesehen haben, aus Mariupol und aus vielen anderen Orten, der dramatische Angriff, den wir heute berichtet bekommen haben, all das erschüttert uns und es ist, das muss hier in einem klaren Wort gesagt werden, grausam. Es ist ein grausamer Krieg mit schlimmen Zerstörungen und mit vielen, vielen Bürgern und Bürgern der Ukraine zum Opfer. Die Tötung von Zivilisten sind Kriegsverbrechen. Die Verantwortung für diese Verbrechen liegt der russische Präsident. In dieser Bewertung sind Boris Johnson und ich uns absolut einig. Und wir sehen uns im Wetter übereinstimmen mit ganz weiten Teilen der internationalen Gemeinschaft für die Recht und Moral weiteren Politiker Maßstab sind. Deshalb unterstützen wir auch die Ukraine tatkräftig mit all den Möglichkeiten, die wir haben. Im zivilen Bereich ist Deutschland seit 2014 der größte Geldgeber und nach dem russischen Überfall auf die Ukraine hat Deutschland eine jahrzehntelange Position verändert und erstmals auch Waffen und Militärgüter in einem Kriegs- und Krisengebiet in Europa geliefert. Und wir liefern weiterhin kontinuierlich Waffen in die Ukraine, wie wir das gemeinsam tun und miteinander absprechen, um den Abwehrkampf gegen die russische Invasion zu stellen. Und natürlich müssen wir alles dafür tun, dass dieses sinnlose, fruchtbare Töten so schnell wie möglich endet. Deshalb fordern wir Russland auf, endlich die Waffen schweigen zu lassen, einen Waffenstillstand zu ermöglichen und seine Truppen zurückzuziehen. Wir brauchen auch unbedingt humanitäre Korridore für die Bürgerinnen und Bürger, die ihre Städte verlassen wollen. Und das darf nicht immer wieder daran scheitern, dass dort militärisch gehandelt wird und diese Flüchtlinge beschossen werden, wie wir immer wieder sehen müssen. Der Krieg muss aufhören und zwar sofort. Eine der zentralen Strategien, die wir haben, ist, Russland mit dramatischen Kosten zu belasten als Folge dieses Angriffskriegs. Und deshalb ist es auch richtig, dass wir in all den Strukturen, auf die wir Einfluss haben, uns verständigt haben auf Sanktionen. Das gilt für die G7, wo wir zusammenarbeiten. Das haben wir besprochen in den verschiedenen Telefongesprächen, die wir mit unseren Partnern zusammen hatten. Das haben wir diskutiert im Rahmen der NATO. Und es sind Sanktionen gegen die russische Finanzindustrie, gegen die russische Zentralbank. Ein außerordentlicher Vorgang, der in dieser Art und Weise gegen ein so großes Land bisher noch keine, noch nicht unternommen worden ist. Entered, I'm talking about sanctions on the Russian economy, and these sanctions are highly effective because indeed Russia is dependent on imports in the field of technology. Russia cannot replace these elsewhere in the global markets, and uh, Europe and North America and Japan, South Korea, many countries that um, gather as democratic states are those who have the best and the most um, sophisticated technologies. And of course, it is also important to affect and hit the inner circle of the president and the oligarchs. And I explicitly want to state this in London as well. And I'm grateful that the sanctions were widened on many persons that are part of this uh, circle of people. We have just accepted and adopted a fifth uh, sanctions package within the European Union. We're not going to import coal anymore. And um, I would like to use this op opportunity to clearly state Germany is already starting to wean off its uh, dependence. And uh, we're diversifying um, our sources. We are investing large scale in order to establish the technical and physical infrastructure that are necessary in order to import gas via no the northern German shores. And we are also going to um, make sure with legal measures that there are no 
legal difficulties, but that we can um, uh, implement uh, our decisions quickly. We have imposed uh, um, sanctions on the banking sector. We uh, hit oligarchs, and we're going to continue uh, to work uh, in this um, uh, uh, regard. Unity is crucial. The unity of the European Union, the G7, the unity of NATO, the transatlantic unity, all of this is essential, and Putin did not expect this. He was certain that we would disagree, and he had to witness our unity, and he will uh, continue to experience our unity. One of the terrible consequences of this terrible war is the fact that a large number uh, of people had to leave the country. Millions of people had to flee Ukraine. Many countries in Europe have hosted um, refugees, in particular those along the borders, Poland, for instance, or Slovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, and we are very grateful to these countries. We know that further countries such as the Czech Republic, Austria, have hosted and received large numbers, and Germany is part of these countries as well. The biggest share of refugees has reached Poland, more than 2 million. We have more than 300,000 refugees in Germany. And this is why we're happy and grateful if many countries would practically participate in hosting refugees, because this will be a major task and challenge ahead. We don't know how refugee movements will um, evolve. Uh, we're seeing a different type of migration now than in other years. We have women and children, the elderly, and many um, people who are uh, sick and disabled and need our support. We will shoulder this together, but against the backdrop of the developments in um, this war, we can't predict how many will follow, whether these families are able to return or whether the men are going to follow. We cannot predict this uh, at present, but what we can say now is that we stand in solidarity, that we want to lend support to those who seek refuge. And we talked about this as well. And the UK also wants to lend a contribution to this effort. Boris mentioned it. We are going to intensify our cooperation on all levels. We're going to have a government consultations and established consultation. We're going to begin um, and ho hosting a cabinet meeting to the beginning uh, at the beginning of the next year. Our foreign ministers are going to to um, resume and continue their strategic dialogue. Um, there are many challenges and um, topics at hand, uh, topics related to the conflict in Ukraine, matters pertaining to um, defense and security, pertaining to climate, people-to-people -people exchange, mobility, and I mentioned it as well, uh, questions pertaining to migration. We want to make progress um, and intensify relations between our two countries. We can build upon about a long-standing friendship, but this is what's important here. We both share the conviction that our relations are good when they don't only exist between the two of us, the heads of state, but when they're also um, when they exist between the people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Olaf. Uh, let's take some uh, questions from the media. Uh, we've got six of them. Nick Erdley, BBC. Thanks, Prime Minister. Um, Chancellor Schultz, first, how do you defend the fact that the European Union has sent 35 billion euros to Russia for energy since the start of the war, but only a billion in aid? Do you really think that Germany has gone far enough, fast enough, to move away from Russian energy? And Prime Minister, how far are you prepared to go in sending weapons to Ukraine without escalating the conflict further? And if I can ask a quick domestic question. This week, you put up taxes for millions of working people. Will you be telling the Chancellor that everyone in his household should be paying all their taxes here in the UK? Olaf, uh, on the... Thank you for the Just to give you a very clear answer, we are doing all we can and we are doing a lot. I think it is a very strong decision that we took to go away from the use of fossil resources 
we invest uh, into uh, becoming the country that will be just using renewables for the electricity we know and for the energy supply we know we, we need and uh, this will be with offshore wind craft this will be with uh, wind wind on land onshore this will be the solar and we will invest into our grid this will take place in approximately 20 years and this is really a very tough agenda to make it clear and right this week we have had a decision in our cabinet on the first legislation projects that are linked to that because we will increase the, the, the velocity of all these activities and this also means to change a lot of legal restraints we have today. On the other hand, it is absolutely necessary that we understand that for the time in between it will be important to get the supply from, of fossil resources from other places than from Russia. And this is why we prepare for being successful with this in the question of coal and oil since December of the last year. And uh, we are doing so and working very hard to make this happen. This is why we could act a line in, 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 uh, according to the decisions that we proposed and made together with our friends in the European Union on how to get out of the use and import of coal from Russia. We are actively working to get independent from the import of oil and we think that we will be able to make it during this year. And uh, we are actively working to get independent from the necessity of importing gas from Russia. This is, uh, as you may imagine, not that easy because it needs infrastructure that has to be built first. So pipelines to the northern shore of Germany, uh, regasification ports that make it possible that, for instance, LNG ships could give their supply to the, to the gas grid in Germany. But we are doing, and we already started preparing this before the war began, because we knew that this problem will come up. And this is why I can give you the very clear answer. We are doing the strongest investments, and we are doing the hardest activities feasible to get independent, and we will be successful. Thank you very much. And, and Nick, I just look just on your... Uh, on your domestic, you know, political point, I, I would just stress that the Chancellor Rishi is doing an absolutely outstanding uh, job, and as far as possible, as I think I, I said yesterday, I, I don't think people's uh, families should be uh, should be brought should be dragged into things. Uh, but on your on your question about uh, about arms and and how far we're we're willing to go and, and the risk of escalation, I just want to say that I think Putin has already uh, escalated the conflict. He's already uh, inflicting systematic slaughter on innocent people. Uh, Olaf has rightly described what's going on in Mariupol and, and elsewhere. It is utterly horrific. And all we are seeking to do is to help the Ukrainians to protect themselves, to protect their families and, and their homes. And I, that seems to me morally an entirely reasonable thing to do. Now, uh, as you know, the UK has been mainly so far supplying uh, anti-tank weaponry, anti-aircraft uh, weaponry. Uh, what we're now looking at uh, doing is finding ways that we can support friends and, and partners who want to send other types of equipment uh, that may be useful to them and uh, to, to the Ukrainians. And uh, I think it's important in these discussions uh, always to, to, to be mindful of what is genuinely useful uh, for Volodymyr Zelensky and uh, and his and his and his and his army, and um, sometimes I think that some of the stuff that uh, some of the kit that NATO has uh, simply wouldn't be uh, appropriate. It may be more useful uh, to to support uh, the the Ukrainians by backfilling and allowing uh, some of the former Warsaw Pact countries to supply some of their own armor in the way that uh, that you've been seeing. And I think that that may be something we'll want to. Uh, to consider uh, doing more of. But uh, clearly, the, the boundary, the limit, is that there is no intention, I don't think, I uh, certainly don't believe that uh, the German Chancellor or any, any NATO leader has any intention of engaging in, uh, in, in direct confrontation between our countries and, and Vladimir Putin. That's, what, that's how Putin wants to portray this. That is not what this is about. This is about an illegal, uh, barbaric attack uh, by Russia on 
uh, totally innocent people that we are trying to help to protect themselves. That's, that's, what, that's what's going on. Can I just say one, th one thing uh, also about your, your question about um, the amount of, of cash that has gone from, uh, from, from Europe to, to pay for Russian uh, oil and gas and, and uh, compared to the... To the uh, just don't, you know, bear in mind the huge steps that uh, the, the EU uh, are already taking, that, uh, that uh, Olaf and the Germans are already taking to, uh, to move away from... Uh, from oil and gas. You know, the, the dependency has been massive. Uh, it's clearly been something that uh, they're now moving away from very, very fast. I think by middle of 2024, uh, as I recall, uh, Germany is going to stop using uh, Russian gas, which is quite extraordinary. And uh, that is going to be done through, through technological change and, and, and progress. And we want to work together uh, with Germany to, to achieve that. Uh, Jörg Blank, DPA. Right, I have a question to you both, uh, Federal Chancellor and uh, you, Prime Minister. As far as the weapons is concerned and the uh, delivery of uh, heavy weapons is concerned, are you willing and ready, Prime Minister, to send tanks to Ukraine? And one question to you, Ukraine um, actually wanted to have martyr tanks um, by Rheinmetall. One per day would suffice. Um, why would you uh, not send such weapons to Ukraine? I think I tried to answer the the question before. I'm in principle willing to, to consider anything by way of defensive weaponry uh, to help the, the Ukrainians protect themselves and, uh, and their people. I think it's important that we should uh, be giving equipment that is genuinely useful and that is operable uh, by, uh, by the Ukrainians. That's our, that's our consideration. Those, as, as I'm sure you saw, uh, there was a delegation uh, from Ukraine, from the Ukrainian uh, Defence Ministry here in uh, in the UK yesterday, looking at, uh, at what more we have to offer. Allow me to follow up. Uh, I, we are trying to send those weapons uh, which are helpful, that can be used. We did so in the past, and we're going to continue to do that. And um, the successes by the Ukrainian military show that we sent uh, effective weapons, uh, anti-tank um, weapons, a lot of ammunition and everything that uh, goes with that. And at the same time, indeed, as the Prime Minister just said, we have to take a close look um, what can be used, at what can be used effectively and um, these are very technical questions indeed. Thank you. Jason Groves, uh, Daily Mail. Uh, thank you. Uh, Prime Minister, on the uh, domestic front, did you know that Rishi Sunak's wife was a non-dom yourself? And <coughs> th there are reports today that people close to you, people in number 10, have been briefing against uh, the Chancellor. What would you say to them? Are they speaking in your name or does he have your full support on this issue? And Chancellor Schultz, I, I heard what you said uh, about Russian energy, but you all know that Germany is sending huge amounts of money uh, uh, to Russia for fuel at the moment. When you see those atrocities in Ukraine, when you hear the mayor of Kiev talk about blood money, do you feel a sense of shame over that? And is the Prime Minister right that you're planning to end gas imports from Russia by 2024? Uh, Jason, now, let, me, let me say, I think the answers to your question are, uh, number one, no. Uh, number two, um, if, if there are such uh, briefings, I, uh, they're, they're certainly not uh, coming from us in, uh, in number 10, heaven knows where they are coming from. And number three, uh, I think the answer is emphatically yes. Uh, I think that Rishi is doing an absolutely outstanding job. It is clear that we are having a big job to do to get independent from the imports of fossil resources, <coughs> and this is mostly about coal, oil, and gas. And as you know, we are working very hard to be successful with this in the case of coal and oil during this year. In the case of gas, as I said, it is absolutely necessary that we build the infrastructure for being able to do so. It is not feasible to get gas instead from Russia today from other places in the amount we need it, and this is the same with most of the other countries in Eastern Europe or also in the South. So it is a big investment into infrastructure and, uh, and not just 
the question of finding new suppliers on other places of the world, which we are doing and which we are working on. It's also the question how we can get this gas to our country, because it's not, it's not helping if it's somewhere in a ship. It needs to be transported. And this is something for engineers and for investments, billions of investments, and we are doing it. And this is why we are quite uh, we are optimistic that we will get rid of the need of importing gas from Russia very soon. And uh, as the Prime Minister said, and uh, we are working tough to, to be successful. Let me also say that the miscalculation of Putin is something that is really bothering him each day more. He knows the sanction regime is working, and this is also on financial sec sanctions against the central bank, for instance. The outcome of this is that he is not able to use the money he, 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 he put in the storages and, uh, on his accounts. Uh, it, was, it was a huge mass of money which could uh, serve him for a long time, but he is not able to get to all these resources for financing his war, and this is why our sanction on certain banks and also on the central bank are so successful and so necessary, to be very clear. But he is also bothering about his mistake because when all the countries in Europe and at many other places that are fighting for democracy and supporting Ukraine are taking decisions similar to Germany, this will have an impact on his economic uh, expectations because if the war would be over, no one could believe that we will stop our investments, that we will stop our view to other countries that could generate the necessary supply. And this is, in the case of his economy, a very, very big, big damage, because if you understand that he is not having uh, industrial sectors that are really earning money from exporting to the rest of the world, it is a problem if his chance to, ex to export gas, oil, coal, silver, uranium and all the other things to other countries is not that successful anymore. He has a problem for the development of his economy. And we were also tough on other aspects, for instance, high technology goods. We are working on being more precise in these fields and questions of IT and software. And all these things together will make it impossible for him to develop his country to an economic strength that make, gives him the chance to be a competitor on mar markets with other countries that are more successful in the economic sector. And so I think we are tough and we will be successful with what we do. Thank you very much, Olaf. Um, Heike Buza from, uh, from RTL. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question to both of you. You, Prime Minister and you, Chancellor, do you have plans to travel to Kiev yourself in order you show your solidarity with Ukraine? And uh, for you both, is there a, a certain timetable for that? And if you allow, the French president is under come under heavy criticism by the Poles for speaking to the Russian president uh, regularly. Do you both believe that uh, it actually pays off and is worth talking to Vladimir Putin on the phone? And if you allow me to ask, how do you, um, uh, um, are, are you in touch personally with the Russian president? Uh, well, thanks, Heiko. Let me, let me, let me just say, uh, first of all, that I, I last spoke to Putin uh, shortly before the invasion and, and um, you can imagine the type of conversation uh, that we had. He said he had no such plans. I said that it would be a catastrophe for Russia uh, if he uh, went ahead, uh, uh, as well as a catastrophe for the, for the, uh, for the wider region, uh, for the world. And uh, so, it has, so it has proved. That's the last time I, uh, I spoke to him. I, I've got to say, I think that um, uh, negotiating uh, with Putin does not seem to me to be full of, uh, of promise and um, I don't feel that he can be, uh, that, he, that, that he can be trusted. That's not to say I don't admire the efforts of people who try uh, to find a way through, uh, but my own view is that I am deeply, deeply skeptical and uh, um, I'm afraid cynical now about, uh, about his assurances. 
Schönen Dank für die Frage. Thank you very much for this question. Uh, the criticism voiced uh, with regards to the French president is unjustified. Um, to put it clearly, he was very committed and in his, in his talks uh, to the Ukrainian president, but also in his talks with the Russian president, he tries to make his contribution to actually uh, that we have the opportunity to achieve a ceasefire and a withdrawal of Russian troops. I know that very well because I am in close contact with the French president, just like with uh, President and Biden and Boris and many others. It is very important that we have a clear stance. Um, only the Ukrainians will negotiate about their country, about Ukraine. There is no one who talks to uh, Putin uh, uh, who would like to uh, replace Ukraine. We try to exchange information and bolster their position. Um, and to tell the Russian president how the situation truly is and to inform him about the extent and the numbers of the um, killed Russian soldiers because this has tremendous repercussions for the Russian army, um, the extent of destruction of Russian weaponry um, uh, that cannot be used in Ukraine anymore. We inform him about the fact that his invasion as he planned it did not move forward the way he had intended to. So so these are things that he may not hear from his inner circle. So it's good that others tell him that. And of course, time and again, it is important to come back to what we want to achieve. And what we really want to achieve is a ceasefire, an immediate ceasefire, that we're seeing Russian troops withdrawing, that R Ukraine can decide on its destiny, um, that this war comes to an end. And uh, it remains necessary to say this. We can all be sure, you can all be assured that we are in close coordination. Um, we will continue to do that. And uh, I said it at the outset, only Ukrainians will negotiate about uh, Ukraine and no one else is going to replace them. But we will support Ukraine. We will uh, strengthen them and lend a um, uh, contribution so that they're in a good negotiating position militarily, financially and with the sanctions that we impose. Allow me. And are you planning a trip to Kiev? Uh, we uh, inform uh, uh, each other and the press when we're starting our trip, actually. We're trying to help people come from Ukraine. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to help uh, our German friends to, uh, to take more refugees as, uh, as well. Uh, Seb Payne, uh, uh, Financial Times. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Uh, Chancellor Schultz, what would you say to those who argue the stability of Europe demands an embargo on Russian energy demands and that Germany should accept the economic price of that, just as it demanded southern European members pay the price during the sovereign debt crisis. And during a meeting of EU foreign ministers on Monday, why are you not discussing an oil embargo? And Prime Minister, um, there's been reports that Chancellor Rishi Sunak held a green card while he was a government minister. Uh, do you think it's acceptable for a member of your government to have a US green card? I believe you were a US citizen and gave it up at one point as well. Um, and given that you've talked about European security and unity and purpose, can you now rule out triggering Article 16 of the Northern Ireland Protocol, given the situation? Thank you. Thank you for your question. I answered to your question already. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks very much. Um, and uh, uh, Seb, um, I'm sorry to have to postpone you this morning. Uh, just, just to say, look, uh, on, on the, um, uh, that issue, uh, the, as I understand it, uh, the Chancellor has done absolutely everything he was required uh, to do. And... Um, what was your second question? Um, it was, uh, was triggering Article 16. Uh, triggering Article 16. Uh, uh, well, uh, we, uh, Olaf, we had a discussion about this, uh, as, 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 as you can expect. Um, uh, we, we, it came up. I think I raised it. Uh, uh, what was the result of that the, discussion? It was entirely predictable. Uh, and um, 
I, I, I don't, I, I don't, the, the, the almost um, uh, seamless harmony that you've observed between uh, Britain and Germany uh, today, I would not, I would, would not wish in any way to interrupt by, uh, by going into that any, any further. But all I will say uh, is that, um, to answer your question, would we take that off the table, uh, the, 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 use, the use of Article 16? And no, clearly not. There is a, there is a problem. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, the, the, there is, as, as I hope has been clear from, uh, from the conversation that, and from what you've heard from uh, Olaf and me today, that, that we, are, we are really, really very much united on, uh, on virtually every other issue of policy. Uh, Suzanne Ebner of, of R&D. Uh, yeah, so um, Prime Minister, Bundeskanzler Scholz, my question goes to both of you. Um, can Western sanctions uh, ever be really effective while countries like India and China continue business as usual uh, with Russia? Uh, Su Suzanne, I think the, it's a, a very, very important question. I, I think that the answer is that, yes, uh, Western sanctions uh, can be and as Olaf said in his uh, earlier remarks, will be increasingly uh, effective. And I think that they will, over the long term, uh, do more and more uh, damage to the economic prospects of, uh, of Putin's regime. And that doesn't mean to say we don't want other friends and partners around the world uh, to do more. And um, I think that uh, for, for China, there's a very interesting question to be addressed. And uh, that is whether the, uh, they really want to be associated uh, closely uh, with what is being done in, uh, in Mariupol, uh, in, in Butcher, uh, whether they really want to be associated uh, with in any way condoning uh, or in any way supporting uh, the, the regime of, of Vladimir Putin. And I think as, as the days have gone by, uh, that question has become increasingly difficult. Uh, for, for China. That is, that is my impression. I agree, and allow me to add. The sanctions that we've imposed so far have a tremendous effect on the economic prospects of Russia. And these sanctions cannot be circumvented when we're talking about the high technology uh, products and other products. because um, many uh, countries have such high uh, advances uh, technologically um, that there are no other countries that can uh, chip in and uh, replace their many um, activities in the field of high tech. And uh, this is why these sanctions are so effective, even though not everyone is participating, but we're advocating campaigning for others to chime in and we still um, we, uh, we, we want to make sure that no one is attempting to circumvent these uh, sanctions, and we do this in direct talks, and I think this uh, also is highly effective. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.